Hello, my name is John David, and I am the writer, producer, and the performer of The Mafia Hairdresser Chronicles, and this is John David and Goliath. And in these next few episodes, I'm going to do something a little different than Season 1 and Season 2 of the Mafia Hairdresser Chronicles. Both of those seasons are based on the 80s and 90s of my real life, but it's fiction. Well, technically fiction anyway, because I changed the names and I condensed the dates so much so that I can call it fiction. Well, John David and Goliath is not fiction. It is almost in real time as well. It's what I'm going through today. Now, in this next episode coming up, I'm going to tell you about this job I secured. I'm going to tell you in this episode how I secured that job and how it turned out to be a nightmare is in the upcoming episodes. You see, right now, I'm going to file bankruptcy. I'm losing my apartment. I will have no real official uh, address to live at. Although I'll have a roof over my head, I'm going to eat good food, and I'm going to be with my dogs, and I'm loved, and I'm happy, and I have a spiritual team on the other side, I feel, and I, I'm i grounded, and I balance my chakras, and I'm kind of upbeat about this whole situation. And I'm going to have to sue the company that wronged me, this job that I got, this dream job, this retirement job, this job that I moved to Florida for from Chicago. So, You have heard the story of David and Goliath, have you not? David was sent to the front lines of a battle, and he found Goliath, who was a nine-foot giant, who mocked everything that David believed in. So David put a rock in a sling, and he swung that rock around his head in that sling and threw it at Goliath's head. And Goliath fell to the ground, and then David picked up Goliath's own sword and killed the giant with it. This biblical story is about courage and faith and overcoming what seems impossible. And this podcast is about the courage and faith that I have to find and rely on every day on my way to overcoming what seems impossible. This podcast is about facing my fears and what we are all going through. So I hope it gives you inspiration or strength or just helps you because you're distracted and you're listening to my interesting tale. Welcome to my real life. Welcome to John David and Goliath. In this first episode, I first want to state that I think Goliath is not the company that I'm trying to slay or throw a rock at. I know they're going to come after me, and I know they're fierce. They have tons of lawyers and money behind them, and I've got nothing except for uh, a righteous sword. I think Goliath is my fears. I have fears of not being good enough sometimes. I have fear of being in relationships. I have fear of being too disciplined and not fun because when I write or I do podcasts or um, do anything creative, nothing else matters. I miss birthday parties. I'm a shitty friend sometimes. And I have always had financial fears. So I'm moving through that by doing this, by protecting my livelihood of the future and fighting for a career that was lost. I have fears of getting sick, even though I've never been a sick person in my life. I've never been to the hospital. I've broken a wrist one time, and I broke the other wrist before I got the cast off, and that was sixth grade, I think it was. But I've never been sick, so why do I worry about being sick? Um, That's just stupid. I, I do believe that you get what you put out there, so if I keep on believing that I'm going to get sick, I'm going to get sick. And I'm going to be happy and I'm going to be healthy and I'm going to do this lawsuit against this company and I'm going to prevail however long it takes and I'm going to be happy doing it. Winning, I don't think there's a winning in this tale. I think it's all just experience and the experience will lead me to another experience And I'm going to be of that mind that what I'm going through today is supposed to happen. And as I stated, I'm about to sue a huge company. 
You see, I moved from Chicago, Illinois, to a completely different state to get a dream job. I researched why I was coming to Florida. I researched why I was coming to Boca Raton. I researched the best company to work for, and I worked my ass off to get that job. I got that job, and it turned out to be a sham. It was just a pack full of lies for me, as well as many employees of that company. That company lied to me and other employees. They kept me working there every time I tried to quit by promising me this would happen and this was in place and this was going to happen. It was going to be just exactly what I knew it could be, but it never turned out to be that way. And there were deals made and they all fell through with this company. And it ended my career as far as my hair career. Um, and I lost my health insurance. I went into debt. I'm losing my home, as I stated, and my chances of financial security were dashed when I was duped into taking this job. And I'll detail all those juicy details in a few episodes. And this company is a Goliath, as I say. They will probably come after me. They have lots of lawyers, and I'm broke. And there are about a 100,000 to 1 employer lawyers, because there's money in that, to every employee lawyer. There's hardly any lawyers out there. If you're an employee, a disgruntled employee, they they just don't want to handle you because it's just too hard for them. An employee lawyer doesn't really want to handle anything but discrimination and injury on the job. And I'm very scared to go up against this company, but I'm all in. I'm going to do this. With that said, I'm not going to tell you the names of the managers and the people I worked for or with. Because I think disguising their names is healthy and good. We live in a strange and reactionary world due to social media and media in general and the council culture. And there's just so much criminal vigilante, human type versus human violence. I don't want to be part of that. And I can attack that Goliath, that council culture by not going public with those people's names. And please do not harm them. Do not come against them. They're just people. And maybe they made the decisions that affected me and my career because upper management made them. So they were in a job and I don't want them to lose their jobs. I wish them only the best. Now, before I tell you anything about working for that company in Boca Raton, Florida, where I thought I had acquired my retirement job, my dream job, I'm going to tell you how I moved from Chicago, Illinois, to a place where I loved, um, that was a place I loved, to another place that I loved, Boca Raton, but I don't love it so much anymore. You see, Chicago was one time my dream job. I grew up in Los Angeles area. I had a boyfriend from 17, from high school to 24, up to the, into the AIDS epidemic. Yay, didn't get AIDS, uh, as so many of my friends had. And I got to hang out with the village people and Rock Hudson and Liz Taylor. And I had um, done some really cool things, like I did things at record company parties. And uh, as a professional, I got to meet a lot of uh, superstar hairdressers and who taught me the best of the best, how to be the best. And I just had a great time. I had my first hair salon at 24. I got that because I got a severance. If you read Mafia Hairdresser, you'll know where I got that severance. And um, yeah, it was a really successful salon till the Reaganomics closed the salon in the new downtown Long Beach. I was with a group of young people. We were all 24 and we helped get the blue line from LA to Long Beach instead of any uh, where else, LA to whatever. It was the first... uh, resurgence of the massive transit. Very proud of that. Um, and I moved just before that opened in 92 to Chicago. And why I moved to Chicago was I was just kind of burned out of LA. I had written a screenplay called Mafia Hairdresser. It shopped around Hollywood for years and years and years. And the Michelle Pfeiffer movie, I think I just had to pause right here and look up the Michelle Pfeiffer movie. It was called Married to the Mob. Married to the Mob came out in 88, 89. So it slowed up the Mafia hairdresser screenplay because it was too close, maybe. I don't know. I think it's totally not Married to the Mob. Anyway, I decided to write a book version because someone said, you'll get a green light from Hollywood if you write a book version of this screenplay. And I moved to Chicago 
And in Chicago, I did lots of things. I even joined Actors Studio Chicago, and that was great. That's actorsstudiochicago.com. That's a plug. Actingstudiochicago.com is the best acting school on the planet. They do New Yorkers. They do Midwesterners. They, I mean, they teach everybody. If you want a good career, and I think I have to say, with the exception of Tony and Tony's wedding, I got every audition I ever went out for right out the bat. Um, including camera work, on camera work, as as well as plays. Yeah, Tony and Tony's wedding is so stupid. <laughs> I, they made me sing, and I'm a terrible singer. And if you've listened to Mavi Hairdresser or the Mavi Hairdresser Chronicles, you heard me sing. Horrible, right? Just horrible. Then the pandemic hit. I had a one bedroom apartment with a great view on Walton Street in Chicago, the Gold Coast. The salon suite I rented out was downstairs in the commercial building next to us. And it was awesome. I had a great clientele. It was everything was going fine. And then the pandemic hit. Also looting happened and Chicago carjackings happened. And me and my newly adopted dogs, Finnegan and Valentina, who were five when I got them, um, not abused. They came from good family and the family picked me to take these two. And I love them for that. One of them hated the city. He hated the violence. We walked into several shootings. We walked into two of the biggest lootings. I think Chicago was the first big looting city, uh, where they rammed a car in through the, the revolving door of Bloomingdale's on the, on the north side, not the main entrance off of Michigan Avenue, the Miracle Mile, but the north entrance, which is right across from the entrance to my condo building where I was renting. Dummies should not run cars through revolving doors. It didn't break, but there was 200 people on the street looting. And I'm on the phone talk, talking to my friends, describing what's going on. They're going, are you crazy? Went into my apartment building and then walked out of my apartment building for something else later after the police roped off everything and then another car ran through the windows finally and then more looters went in there so that was the first looting in chicago and i was right there in the thick of it both times i was on uh oak street which is our rodeo drive in chicago when all the looting was going around trying to get some customers that i'd done in my apartment trying to get them through the crowd of looters into a cab and we were roped off in the city the bridges were up and the police were surrounding the whole area area. And it was a nightmare. And it just got progressively crazier. Again, carjackings. I walked into, I nearly walked near the rapper who got shot on the street. I walked into two shootings and I had lived in Andersonville and Uptown in Chicago, which are a lot rougher than downtown Chicago pre-pandemic. And then now downtown Chicago is what we call shy rat. It's better, but because the mayor and the police are fighting. The police don't really find that arresting criminals is profitable. They all go back on the streets so fast. So I knew I wanted to get out of Chicago. And my friends, Bob and Mary, lived in Boca. And I was traveling back and forth to them and visiting them during the pandemic for weeks at a time. Me and the dogs would take flight down there. And sometimes we'd watch their dogs while they went on three or four week vacations. They have good money, so they could do that. And I just stayed at their place in Boca during the pandemic off and on, maybe every three months. And I fell in love with it. And so I ended up here in Florida where I'm recording this podcast. And I made sure that I was going to be financially secure before coming down here. I researched where to work. Of course, there was no crime here <laughs> compared to Chicago. That was a plus. I could live very close to the beach and I'll tell you about this apartment that I'm recording in right now before I lose it. It's beautiful. But I researched where to work and the Boca Raton Resort was opening up soon. So before I moved in June, I researched when it was going to open up. It was supposed to open up in the fall of 2021. And around the spring of 2021, I found out that the buzz around the Boca Raton Resort was amazeballs. They didn't have any hairdressers. They had one hairdresser I didn't know about. 
uh, and she was continuing to work during the renovations. They put $200 million into the renovations of the Boca Raton Resort. It was acquired by Northview Hotel Group and MSD Partners, which is Michael Estell Partners. That's the company that manages his, mo- his money. And they were probably the money behind the push for this Northview Hotel Group, which owned properties before. They operate and own resorts. This is the biggest one. This has five hotels on it. Um, at the time they opened, I think it was nine restaurants were going to open. And I think they're up to 13 or 14. And they have the newly renovated pools and the lazy river for the kids and hair salon, which was going to be newly uh, state of the art, really beautiful and Chrome and glass, I guess. And then the spa was very rich. There's a great room. People wait in their bathrooms and you go out to the pool and you can go to the website, the Boca Raton, um, see how beautiful that spa is. It's the crown jewel of that resort. They also have golf and they have a yacht club and they have the beach club and they have places where people, the members can moor their boats. It's just a rich person's paradise. And I thought this was going to be the best job ever. And they didn't have a hairdresser yet, to my knowledge. So I set my sights on that job. I moved to Boca Raton for that job. It was going to be my retirement job. It was going to be my dream job because it's only eight hours a day. The prices of the salon services were going to be high. I started nagging and calling the um, HR right away. Like I found a way, I don't even think HR was even born yet there or they had people but i reached people and i called them and harassed them when they opened and opened and fall 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 and then it kind of moved back later but so i moved there for this job it was perfect i knew i was going to make a killing so and anyone that knows about the salon and spa industry and i was a consultant in this industry for a long time knows that when you are a hairdresser at a spa that is attached to a hotel, you can expect a national average of 16% of the hotel guests are going to book with hair, makeup, uh, nails, pedicures, spa treatments like massages and facials. I knew this was great because there was five hotels here and I was going to be the number one hairdresser there because I'm really good, I'm really fast, And I can handle a discretionary clientele. I can keep my mouth shut. Uh, You can tell me all about your billions. You can tell me anything you want. It goes in one ear, out the other ear. Plus, your hair is never going to look better. I know what I'm doing. So I moved to Boca Raton in with Bob and Mary and... They were going to travel a lot this summer, that summer of 2021. And I was going to watch the dogs here and there. And they were such good friends. Bob was my best friend in Chicago. We used to pal around and go to nightclubs and so forth. And we had a nice posse. And Mary and I have become such great friends over the years and even closer now. And her mom and dad also live in Florida. And they are my family. Uh, they're, they're like my base here now. And it was going to be cool. It was going to be the best job ever. So I'd secured through HR that, yes, my resume would come and they'd look at it right away. And I did. So I applied, I think it was mid-July or August. And then I went to a job fair. And then I got to meet the managers, the spa manager and the salon manager. And I met both of them. We hit it off. They were very skeptical. First of all, I think I, I think it was 59 at the time. Yeah, 60 now. And so they were like thinking I was going to be some Devo and be an asshole and snotty. I go, no, no, I'm a good team player. I used to own a hair salon. I know what your fears are. I am really, really good. I work great with other people. I haven't worked with anybody in a long time. I just am a bad manager. That's the only thing. You don't want me managing your people because I'm like... You know, I'm not one of those people like, there is no bad questions. I will say, yeah, that's a bad question. So other than that, I work well with my compadres. So they hired me. But the problem was 
during that summer, I was kind of using money up. I had moved from Chicago to Florida. I was supposed to get a U-Haul and move there. My brother was going to fly in from Northern California and me and the dogs were going to go on a road trip in a U-Haul. Well, the night before we left, the U-Haul company said, oh, we have no U-Hauls. I'm like, you're kidding me. No. That was a time when rent-a-cars were being used up the wazoo because everyone in the pandemic had come out of their houses. We could go and travel now. And it was the beginning of summer, June 1st. So they people started renting U-Hauls for uh, cars and traveling places in U-Hauls, which is crazy. So I had no U-Haul. So within 24 hours, my brother and I and the dogs had travel certificates for the dogs for the airlines from the vet. And he and I had seats on the American Airlines down to Fort Lauderdale, where we'd go to Florida. I secured movers. And those movers were going to take my stuff to Florida and put it in storage in Boca Raton. That was a huge expense. And my buddy, uh, Bob, helped me move. He gave me some money for that. That's thank God, because it was so expensive. Because by the time I got to Boca and the midsummer coming and I was acquiring my job at the Boca Resort, uh, at the Boca Raton, I found out I was paying a storage facility in Chicago because my stuff never left Chicago. And it was hundreds of thousands of dollars that they did not tell me they were going to do. If they had moved it to Boca Raton, like they said, I would have paid nothing because it was a storage company of the storage movers or the movers. So they raked me through the coals. So that was a huge expense. Plus, I'm not working during that summer. And my friends, Bob and Mary, are getting a divorce. So I'm living in their house under that pressure whenever they're home between their trips, which was crazy. I'm not even talking to him because I, I don't like the fact that he's getting divorced and we're having disagreements. There's that. So I end up getting an apartment knowing full well that I had this job at the Boca Resort, the Boca Raton. I shouldn't call it the Boca Resort because they named it the Boca Raton. And to me at that time, it was still the Boca resort and spa. So I started paying rent way too soon before any income came along. I'm also traveling back to Chicago back and forth once a month to do my clients there because I didn't really want to give up that clientele. I had lived in Toronto for a year and I did that. So I knew I could do that and I could just leave my dogs with my friends to a point. But then they started breaking up And so I got my apartment, I got a car, so I started flying back and forth and paying a babysitter for my dogs here, which was great expense, waiting for this job at the Boca Raton, and it was just dragging on, dragging on. They didn't open until December 14th of 2021. There's a reason for that, and I'm going to tell you in the next episode. And it was a bad reason, and it's what killed me. It's what killed my career and the career of many people who started working at the Boca Raton. I got a a great apartment on the beach in Boca Raton. It's a two bedroom, two bath, newly renovated, balconies of the wazoo. It's right around the corner from the Boca Raton. It is almost what I was paying in Chicago for one bedroom because they opened so late, I was eating into my savings like a mf I knew I got the job, so I bought new furniture that I knew I could pay. It was a 0% interest at Rooms to Go. And um, I was okay. I wasn't really worried about it. I knew I was going to make tons of money at the Boca Raton. Hello, dear listeners. In the future, I may have to have a GoFundMe page to raise money for lawyers, but right now I am asking you to support me and support this podcast by purchasing my books in paperback or ebook at amazon.com or ebooks at barnesandnoble.com. Mafia Hairdresser is based on my time in LA when I was a private hairdresser to a cocaine trafficking couple and a very well-known Chicago mobster in the 80s. The Glowstick Gods, the sequel to Mafia Hairdresser, is about the 90s when I was an A-list party boy and I traveled around the world chasing the best raves and parties while observing the demise of the entire scene when crystal meth came into being. And if you'd rather listen to my fabulously dangerous life instead of reading about it, you can just listen to season one and season two of this podcast, The Mafia Hairdresser Chronicles. Just go all the way to the beginning. 
And season three will be out in 2024. That's 2024. Hey, thanks for listening. So by December 14th, I started working in the hair salon. Not the hair salon that they promised was going to open in the fall, but a hair salon. I started working two days a week, December 14th, when they opened up the four of the five hotels in a shitty, crappy room that we had to leave the windows open because it was actually a spa suite for a massage person or facial person that needs to stay warm because your body temperature drops. So the temperature is always hot in those rooms. And I had to open the windows, sweating like a, a pig while I'm doing these rich clients who are paying a hundred thousand dollars to become a member because when the Waldorf Astoria sold it to Northview Hotel Group, they raised the membership from 30 grand to a hundred grand. Ridiculous for what they got. So these customers were coming in and I'm making nice. They're so happy with their hair. They're so happy with the colors that I'm doing. But there was very few of them. I was doing one client a day. I was so slow. It was just killing me financially. You know what? I'm going to stop right here. I told you how I got to Boca Raton. In the next episode, I'm going to tell you about my job there and uh, a lot about this company and how they handled things. Because when they opened on December 14th of 2021, they were caught with their pants down around their ankles. This company opened their salons, their spas, their yacht club, the beach club, four of the five hotels. The Boca Raton was not equipped to do any kind of business whatsoever when they opened. This company made a huge mistake. Someone made a huge mistake. And then the decisions that management made, meaning Northview Hotel Group, made decisions that affected hundreds of people's career, ruined my career, as well as informed the way they were going to do business in 2021 and 2022, which was so under par for a five-star type hotel, let alone one that had five hotels and 20 restaurants on it. It was a fiasco and it cost them hundreds if not millions, hundreds upon thousands of dollars, if not millions and millions of dollars of lost revenue. And they're still hurting today. They are suffering and they will probably have to financially restructurize, have an influx of money, and it will affect whether or not they can sell the property, which I'm sure they're looking at flipping right away. So that's for upcoming episodes. In the next episode, I'll tell you about my job and the lies I had to endure by the management. Again, those lies were handed down from the upper management, which is probably Northview Hotel Group. So that's it. That's all I got to say in this episode. Over and out, this is John David, and this is John David and Goliath.